Yeah. To this scripture, I can't find. That's true. That's true. Hi, everybody. Yay. Hi. Crowd noise in the background. Woo. We need a laugh track or something. Need something so I sound like there's people. Uh, well, you guys are here, so that's awesome. So you should have on your table a copy of the Litany for Humility. And that's going to be our opening prayer tonight. Um, so if you're at home, I'm going to I'm going to play the first part of the line and then you're going to respond. And the response when I pause your response is deliver me Jesus. Okay? And we'll send and a PDF of this tomorrow. Well, and Todd will send you a PDF of this tomorrow. So you will have it so you can pray it on your own after this, okay? It's a beautiful beautiful prayer and it's a great one to pray entering into the subject matter this evening. Mm -hmm. All right? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver, deliver me, Jesus. Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, Deliver. Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised. Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others. Deliver, Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted. Deliver, Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved. Deliver, Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being columnic. I can't say this word. Columnated. Thank you, columnated. Deliver, Deliver me, Jesus. Jesus. Sorry. From the fear of being forgotten. Deliver, Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver, deliver me, Jesus. And now we're going to change our response. It's going to change to Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be loved more than I. Jesus, grant, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be esteemed more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be chosen and I set aside. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised and I unnoticed. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred to me in everything. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. Jesus, Jesus grant, grant me the grace to desire it. Amen. Amen. In the, name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So last week, Sam asked online, um, Sam's one of our folks that's in, she's in uh, RCAA. She asked, why was there no Holy Spirit in the Old Testament at the time of Moses? Just because of our time. Great question, and it actually leads into today. So I thought it was it was really good. So the Holy Spirit has always been around. Amen. Because yeah. the Holy Spirit is God. God is a Father and a and a Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's always been there. The opening line of Genesis talks about when God created the heavens and the earth, the Spirit hovered over the chaos of the waters, right? The Spirit was there in the very, very beginning. But 
for whatever reason in God's plan, he withheld the spirit a bit in the degree that the Holy Spirit is not like poured out in the people yet. It's going to happen later. Through the Old Testament, so from the time of Adam and Eve all the way up to Jesus, there are little hints, little peaks of the Holy Spirit. Um, in the book of Wisdom, wisdom is talked about like the Holy Spirit. It's just beautiful. In the feminine, too. It's like this, this feminine, this, this understanding, this knowledge, and, and um, the, the love of the Lord and the fear of the Lord, meaning like respect and awe. It's just beautiful. So there's lots of lines about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The prophets are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit like speaks through the great prophets. Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and all the rest of them. There's a scene when, in, with, at the time of Moses, where Moses like lays hands on all the leaders of Israel, and there's 70 or 72, 72 leaders in Israel that are filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it specifically talks about like they're given the special grace of God to be leaders. But it's not until the New Testament when Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus tells the apostles, I'm going to go away, and then I'm going to send to you another counselor. I'm going to send to you another one who's kind of like me, is what Jesus is saying. And, and I have to go away before he comes. Why exactly? It's a little mysterious. But for some reason, Jesus has to whoosh, go away. <laughs> and then he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And when he sends the Holy Spirit, then in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, he sends the Holy Spirit into each and every one of the believers, right? Into those that are going to receive. And then we kind of acknowledge that in the sacrament of not only baptism, but especially in confirmation, right? The Holy Spirit comes to each one of us. Um, so for whatever reason, it's God's plan. He's the one that designed it. And he decided there's going to be a new movement of that Holy Spirit that's going to happen after Jesus goes away, where this Holy Spirit is going to pour into the people. And a new movement of the Holy Spirit is going to begin. Part of that new movement of the Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is going to fill us with virtues and gifts and power. And it leads into what we're going to talk about today today. Um, about virtues. Virtues are habits of goodness, habits of holiness. So we have, we have, when we have a virtue, it's like a really good habit that, that's good for us in, in, a, in a spiritual kind of sense. Um, in our book, in chapter 13 of Catholicism for Disciples, chapter 13, uh, page 215, being good when sinning is so easy. Can anyone relate to that? <laughs> it's hard to be good when sinning is so easy. Um, what it talks about is that uh, Catholic morality is more than just avoiding what's sinful. It says in the first line, just as peace is more than just an absence of war. In a, we're going to take a Jewish understanding of peace. Peace in, in Hebrew is shalom. Everyone say shalom. shalom. Hey, you're Hebrew. <laughs> So shalom is peace in, in Hebrew, and it doesn't just mean like things are calm. It means things are balanced, like things are back to perfection, like things are the way they're supposed to be. That's shalom. So when you say shalom, when you say peace be with you, that's what we're really asking for, for things to be the way they're supposed to be, not just a lack of war, right? So much, so much more than that. Um, so what we're going to look at, we're going to look at cultivating some good habits, the virtues, and then we're going to look at the bad habits, the vices. And we're going to go through this kind of quickly. The book goes into really good detail. These are, this is one of my favorite chapters in this book because it explains these things super well. And I really like the explanations. It's in laid it. out really well. It's really it's laid really out really well, nice yeah. Because every once in a while there's a chapter I'm like, I don't know why they did that. <laughs> this one, I, I just really, really like the way they laid this one out. So on page 216, a virtue is, is a habit of holiness, basically, right? It's, it's going to be a habit that um, it, it says about halfway into that first paragraph, where it's a habit where God's intervention bolsters a person's soul, providing the necessary oomph to do the right things. 
I like that. That's what a virtue is. And some of the virtues are just natural to us. Some of the virtues come through God and through the Holy Spirit. So the first four virtues that you may have studied this before, I mean, even back in high school, or if you ever took a philosophy class, high school or, or college, um, the four cardinal virtues are talked about even in philosophy, in Greek philosophy. This is like standard. This is not just a Christian thing. The cardinal virtues are like worldwide. Almost all philosophy recognizes it. If you're Buddhist, if you're Islamic, if you're Christian, if you're Jewish, they all talk about these virtues too, as well as the Greek philosophers, the Stoics. Um, and these are natural in the sense that they're, they're part of what it means to be human. Th these are natural. They come out of our humanity. Um, and cardinal means hinge. So like the hinge uh, car uh, virtues, the cardinal meaning, meaning like a hinge virtue. So any other good thing that, that we do, any other good virtues, they kind of hinge on these. You can, you can boil them all down to these four, basically. That's what that is. Now, the way that I remember this, P-J-F-T. P-J's for Todd. That's how I remember the four virtues. I had to memorize this for a class when I was doing you know, this for a theology class, and I was like, how do I remember all this stuff? That's what everything has a little mnemonic like that. PJ's four taught prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance are those four natural virtues. So you don't have to know Jesus to have these virtues. But if you have these virtues and if you're exercising them, having Jesus, having the Holy Spirit, having the sacraments will strengthen them, right? They'll give you even extra oomph. They'll give you even something more. In fact, one of these four cardinal virtues are actually a gift of the Holy Spirit in a supernatural way. We'll talk about that when we get to it. So prudence. Prudence is basically common sense. How many of us have that? <laughs> prudence. It, it depends on the day. It means having a filter, right? You know what that one means, right? Um, Angel will testify to this. There was a time I was on a, a certain medication that repressed a lot of emotion and, a, and, and, and it made me very thoughtful, but I didn't like it for a lot of different reasons. When I got off this particular medication, I lost my filter. <laughs> I not only was really emotional all of a sudden, and I hadn't been in so long, but it's like, it's like anything that I thought just came out of my mouth. I had to relearn prudence. <laughs> I said that's a long time. Was that a yeah? It's still in progress too. That's true. <laughs> but to be prudent is to like know when to say what. That's one of the things of prudence. Prudence means it's a very balanced, very wise, very careful, thoughtful plan of action. That's prudence. Um, there's a time to be John the Baptist. And there's a time to be gentle Jesus, right? So if you, if you know the story of John the Baptist, remember he's in the, in the desert um, just before Jesus gets baptized. He baptizes Jesus and he's screaming and yelling at the crowds and at the Pharisees. He calls them snakes and brood of vipers. And he says, basically, you're going to hell and you're horrible people and I don't like you. And like he's winning converts somehow by, by <laughs> preaching like this. In, in Baptist terms, we used to call that fire and brimstone preaching, right? And we hear that sometimes. A prudent preacher knows sometimes you need to be John the Baptist. Sometimes people need to hear that. They need to be up against the wall and say, you're going to hell if you don't change your ways. Like there's a time for that. But a prudent person will say, there's also a time that you don't do that. <laughs> There's a time that you're like Jesus. One of my favorite scenes in the New Testament, um, the, the, the bad guys bring a woman to Jesus who is caught being very naughty, right? Mm -hmm. the, the woman caught in adultery. And they're getting ready to stone her, which was the punishment. And Jesus is very prudent. And he says, well, if any of you have never sinned, you throw the first stone. And that's a prudent, wise little thing. And then he does something really weird. He gets down on the ground and he starts writing in the dirt. He starts writing, right? And the Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote. Most scholars think he was probably writing their names and their sins. 
We don't know for sure, but I like to think that. So he's writing like Tobias stealing, <laughs> you know, Jonathan lying, you know, whatever it is. And it, a very prudent, wise, careful decision on his part because it worked really well. When you're prudent, the things that you're doing, it's going to work well for you, right? Because you're being wise, you're being prudent, you're being balanced. Um, so obviously prudence takes practice. <laughs> it takes a lot of prayer. It takes some, you got to calm down and think a little bit. But to make a prudent decision, like with all of these virtues, the way that we get better at them is we exercise them. We do it. We just, we try and we think about it and we, we prayerfully, intentionally respond to things. Prudence, making wise choices. Right? Justice is treating people fairly. Um, way back when I did youth ministry years ago, one of the classes I did, we said justice is when you get beyond just us. I like that. So it's like fairness to everyone. That's justice. Um, things are balanced. Things are fair. Things are right. That's justice. Um, breaking justice could be stealing, breaking a promise, uh, lying, gossiping, any of those things that we talked about last week with the Ten Commandments, the last seven at least, those are all kind of like infractions against justice in one way or another. The book goes into good detail on commutative justice, which is just between two people, right? Um, like a, a quid pro quo, we hear that a lot lately, um, <laughs> which is just Latin for this for that. It just means I do this, you do that. And it's usually in a negative term when we usually hear it nowadays. It doesn't have to be negative. It means if 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 I if a contractor fixes the plumbing in my house, I pay him money. That's a this for that, right? That's commutative justice. It's fairness. There's distributive justice, which is a relationship between one person and many people. And then there's social justice, which is kind of like all of us together. And and the book kind of explains these really really super well. But justice basically means fairness, doing the right thing, right? So if you're prudent, you're wise, you're careful, you're well-balanced, you have common sense, and you're just, like what a great combination, amen? What a great combination. That means you're going to do the really fair, wise thing. Then there's temperance, my favorite. Temperance is moderating pleasure. Temperance, I love the, the paragraph here. This is the only one I'm going to read. Feast or famine. This is on page 220. Many people live at extremes, too much or too little. Some party hardy and others are party poopers. I won't say where I am in that list. From Puritans to hedonists, the practices of self-deprivation and self-indulgence run the gamut. But the choice doesn't have to be either or. Temperance is... But we sometimes say all things in moderation. You've heard that before. So temperance is not going overboard with things, but it doesn't mean that you totally avoid everything that's fun or, or that tastes good either, right? Um, it's a balance. It's a virtue where a person can balance these kinds of things. Um, moderation, avoiding excess. My mom grew up in a very strict Baptist household. My grandfather was a Baptist minister. Um, for years, there was no alcohol, no movies, no dancing, no television. By the time I came around, grandpa had, had bent the rules and he watched Gunsmoke on TV. <laughs> so Gunsmoke was a lot, if you remember that show. I remember we were talking about Star Wars, and he thought that was the craziest thing ever. Like, why would you go to a movie about spaceships and robots? Like, he just did not understand it. Um, and he had softened a little bit. But she grew up in a strict, like, no, you can't. It's like you can't have fun. You can't enjoy these things. They're all sinful because they're enjoyable. Well, you don't want to go that far necessarily. But I remember the first time I was really in the Catholic Church, I was, I was working at a Catholic church, and I saw priests smoking cigars and drinking bourbon. I was like, my grandfather would have had a heart attack if he saw a man of the cloth 
drinking a drink and smoking a cigar. But there's nothing wrong with that occasionally in the right order. And I, I always struggled with it, probably because of the upbringing that I had. And it was Father Matthias, those of you who know Father Matthias Thalen, he's the one that really said it for me in a way that I really got it. Because I had made a comment about we were there was something we were doing, I can't remember, and there's a little bit of wine, a little bit of good drink going around. And I made a comment about, okay, where does this get excessive? Where is this gluttony? And he said, when I enjoy these good things, if I give glory to God, and if I say thank you, and if I say, I really don't deserve this, but man, I enjoy this because it, it points to heaven. And it brings out the glory of the things in this world that are wonderful, that are beautiful, that, that taste good. But if I'm giving that glory to God, I think that's in the right balance. But if I'm doing it too much, if I think I deserve it, that's where we usually go overboard. If I think I don't need to say thank you, I just deserve to have this, he goes, that's when that is no longer temperance. That's like over the top. Isn't that, isn't that great? So it's like when you, when you have a good drink, there's, I won't mention any names, but there's a certain family that's one of the people that is in this room and had an, an absolutely amazing drink of bourbon. I've never had anything like it in my life. I won't say who it is, Jan, but it was absolutely like I have never tasted a drink like this. Oh my goodness. And the, the flavors, the rolling, the different, like I had never experienced anything like that. And I'm like, that is amazing. But, you know, it's one time. <laughs> oh, it's Scotch? No, no, it was bourbon. Oh, it was bourbon. Yeah. Oh, you got some Scotch like that too. Now everyone's going to your house. <laughs> but moderate, right? Once in a while, a celebration. And I tell you, I gave glory to God. <laughs> Like, and because I don't expect that that's going to be something that I'm going to have all the time, right? And I've never, I've never once in my life been drunk. When I say it to people, they usually don't believe it. But I really, I've never drunk to the point of, of getting drunk ever because I don't like the way it feels. Now, it, there are other things maybe, but <laughs> that's not my issue though. <laughs> um, it's knowing when to say when, right? That's temperance. And how do you get good at that virtue of temperance? You just do it. You practice it. When you're, when you're offered something and it's too much, you say, no, I don't need it right now. Or I've already had that. I don't need more of that. I, I'm working on that when it comes to food lately. It's really been an issue. I put on a lot of weight lately because I've become intemperate with sweets. I'll talk about that more later. <laughs> the fourth one is fortitude. Doing what's right come hell or high water. In other words, it's courage, it's strength, it's stick to itiveness. Sometimes we hear it say perseverance in times of trial and tribulation. Um, it gives you, when you have this great virtue of fortitude, it's what gives you strength. Now, fortitude is also a gift of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the Holy Spirit, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, fear of the Lord. Oh my gosh, I remember them. <laughs> I was really hoping you wouldn't call it. <laughs> yeah, I remembered it that time. Fortitude is one of those gifts of the Holy Spirit. So even though it's a cardinal virtue, it can also be a gift that God specifically gives us at baptism, at confirmation, that can come to life. And it's courage to stand up and do what's right. It's courage to be temperate. It's courage to be just, right? It's courage to be prudent. Does that make sense? They all kind of work together. Now, like I said earlier, even the great philosophers of the world, they all talk about these gifts and they write about them at great length. Um, but then there's what we call in the Christian world, we call the theological virtues. So theos means what? The Greek word theos, T-H-E-O-S. What does that mean? Of God. Theos is of God. So God and logos is words. Like the word of God. Um, God in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the logos. In Greek is what it would be. So theos, logos are God's words. Theos, logos. Theology. 
words about God, words from God, words of God, right? Amen? That's what theology is. These are theological virtues. That means they're, work, they're virtues that not only point to God, but that God gives us. That are spoken into our lives by God. Oh, isn't that cool? That's the theological virtues. So they're not natural. They are supernatural. And they're gifts that come to us through the Holy Spirit. And some people have an abundance of one or two or maybe all three of these if you're really, really lucky. But we're, we're all called to operate out of them to some degree. If you're baptized, confirmed Christian especially, it's expected that these are in our lives somehow. So the three theological virtues are the, are the ones that St. Paul talked about. And it's all throughout the, uh, the New Testament there are hints of them. A lot of times when you find one, you find the other two in the sentences right around them. It's really interesting the way that works. Faith, hope, and love, love or charity, sometimes it's called, which is more of a, the Greek version of that. Charis um, is, is the Greek. Um, faith, hope, and love. Um, we talked before about faith in one of the earliest episodes, one of the earliest sessions here we did in RCAA. Faith is both a gift and it's a response, right? To some degree, God gives us faith. He gives everybody just a little faith, but you have to respond in faith. And if we respond in faith, the little faith he gives us grows. And he's going to give us a little more faith. And so what do we do? We respond to that faith again, and it's going to grow bigger. And every time, it's just like exercising the faith muscle. The more you exercise it, the bigger the faith is going to get. And that faith empowers us to believe in God and in everything he's revealed. Somebody with a supernatural charism of grace, that means they're like abundantly filled with tons and tons of faith, will be somebody like a Mother Teresa that can walk into a country that she's never set foot in and just like do what it is that God called her to do. That's like really awesome, super abundant faith. We're all called to do that to a degree, but each one of us kind of in our own story. Um, she had an amazing amount of faith. And then there's hope. Think of hope as hope is faith toward the future. That's what hope is. Hope is I have faith in what's going to happen in the future. It's trust in the promises rooted in the future. Um, so faith and hope. Amen. And then there's love. And this is, doesn't mean like I love pizza. I love puppy dogs. I love, you know, my Twitter feed or whatever, whatever your particular thing is. I, I don't love Twitter feed, but uh, I, don't know what that is. I don't even know what it is. I have no idea how to get on one. But, but love in the sense of the Christian sense, remember what that Greek word is for the ultimate love? Agape. Yeah, agape. Agape love, which is the kind of love that's totally selfless. It's aimed at another person. That's the kind of love it's talking about. Christian love is... I love the Lord my God with all of my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind, right? That kind of love. And also, a great definition of love, love is to make someone else better at my expense. It's a great definition. You make someone else better at your expense. Selfless, giving to somebody else. That kind of love comes from God. That kind of faith, hope, and love those are the theological, supernatural virtues. If you don't have any of this in your life, you need to really question whether or not you've really had an encounter with God. I mean, for real. Because if we encounter God, if we've said yes to Jesus, we should have some bit of faith, hope, and love growing within us. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to pop out in full bloom the minute that you say, yes, Jesus, right? But there's going to be little seeds of it, hopefully. Hopefully you see little bits of it. And then they're going to mature and grow. Um, and when we talk about faith, it's not blind faith. I don't know if you remember, we talked about that way back a couple months ago. And it's not blind faith. It doesn't mean it's like ignorant. It doesn't mean you close your eyes the whole time. But it's faith with, wide, with eyes wide open. 
It's faith believing and understanding with, with what God's going to do. It's faith that is prudent, right? Using common sense, right? But sometimes it gets pushed to the limit. And, and that's that kind of supernatural faith. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Now, one thing um, I want to make sure that we, we throw out to everybody, um, if you've got questions and things, I know this is not the best situation because we got half of y'all live, half of y'all on, on Zoom, and then half of y'all watching on video later where you can't ask questions anyway. But if you have questions, please don't, don't think like you're going to interrupt the flow or something. I mean, that's, that's it's fine. To do that. That's why we're here. But we just keep plugging away unless we're interrupted. So, um, frankly, most of the time we'd like the interruption so we can rethink about what. We're doing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so you can fix what you just said that was all wrong. Yeah, <laughs> and also the um, uh, feel free to afterwards too email or, or give us a call or something too because that's I and mean, that's how we, we all learn. And I guarantee if you've got a question, I guarantee somebody else is asking the same thing. Uh, it always happens that way. Now my favorite part, the seven deadly sins. And the reason I want to talk about this is because I want to talk about really where they come from. So one of the hats that I wear, one of my favorite things to do is a, is a spiritual director, which basically just means I spent two years in training to listen to people <laughs> and to just say, what is God telling you to do? That's what a spiritual director does. <laughs> I, I say two things. I say, what's your prayer life like, right, Jan? <laughs> what's your prayer life like, and what's God telling you to do? That's what a spiritual director does. And sometimes you just nod. And sometimes you just nod, and you pray, and you're praying, and you're going, God, help me. I don't know what to say. Or I yawn. <laughs> or I yawn. I yawn <laughs> but what I like about the, talking about the seven deadly sins is I want to talk about where these come from in us. Because if, if there's a deadly sin that rises up in us, it comes out of brokenness. It comes out of need. It comes out of something that's not right inside of us. Amen? I know a lot of you know this, because we, and we've talked about this before, too. But as, as you may have guessed, along with cultivating good habits, we also have to talk about bad habits. This is on page 223. The seven deadly sins are called deadly because they are mortal sins. They're serious sins. And if they're not just mortal sins by themselves, they can lead. If you, if you continue on the path with these, they're going to lead to something worse and worse. Um, and remember, we've, we've talked about this before, but we'll review it really quickly. A mortal sin is a sin that breaks our fellowship with God. Right? It's really serious. Like we need to go to confession if we've committed a mortal sin. And there's three things that make a sin mortal on page 223 and 224. It has to be serious, like grave matter, like breaking a commandment. Okay, that's one of the, it's, it's a big thing. Second thing is there has to be understanding. There has to be full knowledge. Like you have to, you know it's a sin. Even if you may not have studied it and like read Oh, oh, I know that's a sin because they said that in class. It doesn't have to be like that, but you know in the depths of your heart, too. Remember we talked about the natural law, those laws that are written on our hearts. People know when they've done something wrong. They may not admit it. They may not even admit it to themselves, but they know. So a mortal sin is serious. You know that it's wrong, but here's the biggie. You choose to do it anyway, Right? Deliberate consent. So a mortal sin are those things you know it's wrong, you know it's serious, I do it anyway. Um, but then a, a venial sin are the sins that, are, that, that only have maybe one or two of those elements. <laughs> maybe you knew it was wrong, but it really wasn't your consent. Like, I don't know, you just reacted quickly out of a response because somebody was coming at you with a knife. And your immediate response was to defend yourself and you, you kill them. Ah, I mean, that's like an extreme. But that wasn't like a thought out, planned, I chose to deliberately do it, right? That's, that's like a whole different thing. Or sometimes if you have an addiction or if you have um, a mental disability of some kind or there's something within your soul that's like, it, it's not your choice to do it. You're compelled to do something. A lot of times the priest will say, that's not really mortal. 
because it really wasn't your choice anymore. It might have been your choice to do it the first time, but then once it becomes like an addictive thing or a cycle, you're talking about a different kind of thing. And, and this is really dicey. This gets, this gets confusing sometimes. Don't think of any of the sins. We'll talk about this more as we talk about confession more. Don't think about things as like this black and white list where, where you go down and you go, oh, check, check, check. It's usually not that clean. It's when usually you, a little murky. When you say that um, there are sins sometimes that aren't resolved anymore, mm-hmm. are you talking about like generational sins? Yeah, so there can be generational sins uh-huh. that you just inherit. I mean, literally, you right. inherit a pattern. Yeah. Um, anger can be one of those things, that, which we'll talk about here in a minute. That, that's the only thing you know because it's what you grew up with. And so are you responsible for that? Well, in a, in a unique way, yes, to some degree, but what, what, we're going, what we're going to find, especially when we're talking about all this stuff, is the mercy of Jesus in all this. He is so merciful. Like he is not the hard judge looking, trying to catch us with a spy cam. He's trying to catch us doing something bad. He knows the reasons behind these things. And, that, and that's why we're going to talk about some of that. What are some of the things that, that compel us? Why do we feel that we need to do these things? Because we're broken. There's something inside of us that's hurting, right? Jesus knows that. It's, oh, he's always going to be really, really merciful in that. On page 224, there's a list of the deadly sins and then a list, list of what they call here the conquering virtue. So it's like the opposite virtue. So if you, if you deal with pride, if that's your major sin, the way that we conquer that is we try to develop the virtue of humility. See that? Now, we're going we're gonna to go into great detail on this a couple weeks from now with a little different listing on some things that, that we'll do a little bit later. But we're going to go through this just kind of briefly. Um, don't let this overwhelm you. If you say, oh, my gosh, I struggle with every one of these, <laughs> welcome to the club. Welcome to you, <laughs> Like we've said before, it's okay not to be okay <laughs> here at St. John. Um, so yeah, I think all of us probably struggle with every one of these a little. And there's usually one or two that really are big. They really are pronounced. So first of all, pride. Now, it, we don't mean pride like, you know, oh, you won the race. I'm so proud of you. Like that's not sinful that, that you won the race and you're proud. Um, pride is an inordinate love of self, like out of balance, love of yourself, like you come first in everything. You cut in line, you take the biggest piece, right? You, you have the controller in your hand at home. You're the one that decides where everything, you know, where the money goes. Um, I heard it said once, I love this image, your life is a movie and you're the star. <laughs> Everyone else is a bit player, right? That is a great definition of pride. You see the whole world through you, right? You're the star of the movie. Vanity, um, self-confidence to a crazy degree. We're not just talking, I'm confident in my abilities, but like, I am so good, I am God. <laughs> I mean, that kind of thing. Crazy high over esteem, uh, exaggerating your abilities and your gifts and your talents. Somebody who's really prideful tends to, they tend to ignore their weaknesses, they ignore their failures, but see them in everyone else. <laughs> we can't relate to this, can we? Um, liking yourself is not sinful. In fact, it's very healthy. But when your self perception no longer is real, you begin to think you're more important than you really are, right? That's pride. Vanity, ration, you rationalize, you make excuses, you refuse to obey others. There's a lot of disrespect. Um, I want to show you two, two flip sides of pride that some people think are opposites, but they come from the same thing. They come from pride. Like some people who are really prideful don't care what anyone thinks about them. They really don't care because I am so awesome. I don't care what you think. You could throw things at me. It will deflect because I know that I'm awesome. That's very prideful. But then there's another kind of pride that's really similar. Some people 
are so concerned of what everyone else thinks, everything is about what other people think of them, that becomes vanity because they see everything and well, what are they going to think about me? I have to look this way. I have to act this way. I have to talk this way because it's still all about me. You get that? But, but you're coming at it from two totally different things. So sometimes people don't realize that that's vanity too. It can even be vanity to say, oh, I'm so bad. Oh, I'm terrible. Oh, but it's like, I'm the worst. I'm the worst ever. I'm the best of the worst. Woe is me. Woe is me. Because what's happening? It's still all about me. Right? Ow. All of those are pride. Here's the worst kind of pride. As a spiritual director, this one is impossible to deal with. When somebody is a really good person, they're very moral, very upright. They do all the right things, but they think they're the source of their goodness. And they can't see pride because they really don't do anything wrong, right? So it's like, how do you convince somebody who thinks that they're right, because they are right a lot of the time, how do you convince them that it's prideful when they think they're the source of the goodness? They don't realize the goodness comes from God. And they've been graced, right? Um, and what tends to happen, they're very harsh with other people, very judgmental, because it's really easy for them to be holy, and they can't figure out why you can't be, <laughs> right? That is like the worst kind of pride. And, and that's, that's the way the devil really gets at people. Somebody who is really good and holy, Satan will get in and twist it and really manipulate it. So where does this come from? Where does pride come from? I, I don't want you to think that the church approaches this really heavy handed and says, oh, it's really evil and it's awful. And anyone who's prideful, you know, oh, it's just, it's the worst thing ever. The way the church approaches it is by saying, okay, we're really broken. How do we fix it? And where does this come from? So Sometimes, why would we so be so vain? Why would we care so much about what other people think about us? What do you think? What would lead to that? What would be broken in us? Okay, because we really have low self-esteem. Our self-esteem is broken. So what, what happens? We overreact, right? We really feel crappy. That's the traditional bully, right? The traditional bully really feels crappy about themselves, so they lash out at everybody else. That's really, it's a kind of pride, right? And where does it come from? It actually comes from, even though they act like they're big and inflated, they really don't feel that way. Like, that's super sad. Um, if you live in a household where you're ignored, um, if... If you live in a, in a household where you're never noticed, right, where nobody, seems like nobody cares about you, what are you going to do? You, we usually we overreact and we blow up in the other direction. So pride, even though it looks like somebody's just so inflated, it really a lot of times comes from brokenness. It all does. Now, the church teaches that pride is the biggest sin because ultimately everything flows out of pride. Adam and Eve, when they when they when they sin, and Satan when he sin, when when sin when when Satan deceives them, the ultimate pride is saying God doesn't have you know my, my best interest in, at, at heart. God doesn't really care. I'm going to take care of this myself because I know better than God. I know better. That's what sin is when we say that, right? I'm not going to follow you. I know better. Every sin flows out of this pride. Because one way or another, we're all broken. Yikes! The way that we combat pride is with humility. To be humble. This, to be humble just means to be honest. It's to say, you're God and I'm not. That's what it means to be humble. Humility comes from the word humus, which is like the dirt on the ground, the, that that like soil where we plant things is the humus. So if you're, if you're close to the ground, if you're close to the humus, you're like looking reality in the face because man and woman came from 
the crown, the dust of the earth, right? So it's like looking at your reality and being low. That's what humility means. And it doesn't mean, oh, I'm so bad, I'm a worm. It's it's <laughs> compared to God, I'm a worm. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what it is. He's God and I'm not. That's humility. Amen? Envy. The second deadly sin against God. Envy. Now, Angel talked about this last week with Drake, talking about coveting, the jealousy and envy and all those things. So I, I don't want to repeat all that. But envy is basically, I want what you have, and I'm, even, I'm going to take it, I'm going to hurt you, or I'm going to destroy that thing. It, it's something destructive because you want something that really doesn't belong to you. There's a, there's a broken, so it's a resentment of what other people have. It's a resentment of other people's good fortune. Um, it talks about on page 227, a jealousy of losing your status, position, notoriety, or esteem. Um, being insecure, apprehensive, fearful of peers taking what they have and surpassing you, like that kind of stuff. All of that is envy. None of us can relate to that, right? We, we don't have any problem with that. What, where would that brokenness have come from, do you think? Where would that have come from? Maybe, maybe you had nothing growing up. I'm just thinking of material mm-hmm. thing. You just had nothing growing up. I mean, this is classic class warfare stuff. Um, we're watching one of Angel's favorite shows, The Crown. It's really good if you've never seen it. It's it's like the it's like a soap opera of of, of Queen um, Elizabeth's family, mm-hmm. right? Trapped from the end of World War II to modern times. Really, really well done. Um, and you start to see slowly as England is going through the 1960s, especially starting to see this class warfare where suddenly the, the working class are saying, we hate the royal family because they have everything that we don't have. And you just see this, whereas before they were honored and respected, you see this huge shift. It's like, that's really classic. They have something that I want. I hate them. That's envy, right? Isn't it so easy, even if you just want the thing? Yeah. Them, right? Well, not so much, because that could be jealousy. So, and jealousy can be not necessarily bad, because God is a jealous God. But you guys said that God can be jealous because we belong to him. Right, because we belong to him. Right. Being jealous for something that you don't have doesn't give you belong. Right, exactly. So when, you're, when you want something that really belongs to you, and you just want it, like that's not a bad jealousy. Right. Right. But if you want something that doesn't belong to you, yeah. Like that doesn't belong to you, that's right? Coveting. That's coveting then, yeah. That crosses the line to coveting. And then, but but um, envy is going to be not only do you want it, but like there's so much anger and there's hatred and like I'm willing to destroy it or destroy you because I want it so bad, right? That classic thing of if nobody's going to, you know, if I'm not going to have you, nobody's going to have you, uh, you know, like all the bad guys in the movies. So it can come out of a, like you grow up with nothing and you're like, I think I deserve that, right? And that's, there's no, I mean, in a way there's nothing wrong with that of, of saying, I really wish I had more. What's wrong is when you say, I want to take it. I, I, and I hate you because you have it, right? Or I'm willing to destroy that for that. Um, the opposite of that would be, so to counter envy would be meekness, and kindness, just being very meek and kind. And we're gonna again, we're gonna talk more about the virtues and the, and the opposite vices a little bit more in a couple of weeks. So a little bit different. Lust, lusting after fruit that's forbidden. So here specifically, we're talking about um, sexual lust. It doesn't have to just be that. But for the most part, that's what we're thinking about. Because um, there's some other things coming up: gluttony and greed that kind of cover the other things. So for the most part, it's like sexual lust, imagining, treating others. The big thing is treating others like objects instead of like people. Amen. Um, just for your own physical pleasure, just for what you want. Not thinking of that person as a person. Not realizing that person is an individual made in the image and likeness of God, but that I want something from them, right? In a, in a way that, that's not mutual. It's not, it's not a mutual thing. All oh, the brokenness where that flows out of. Okay. Can you explain that? 
Yeah, so sometimes there's something traumatic that happened to us in the past, and it's a pattern that we don't know any other way to express it, right, sometimes, because that's how it was expressed to us. It's horribly tragic when it happens. Um, I, I had a counselor once say um, to somebody I know really closely, like, I don't know, maybe me, <laughs> that, that it's like sometimes the drive for that is because you feel so unloved Deep inside, you feel so unloved that you're insatiable. Like you just can't, you just are insatiable for love. And like, if you're not getting love in all the right places, you're going to look in all the wrong places, right? That's, that's the biggest drive, I think, ultimately of everything is that we don't feel wanted or respected or loved. And we try to cover it up. We try to fill the void. You know, how many times have you ever heard, it's a big thing in Protestant circles, especially that we all have a God-sized hole inside of us, right? We always talk about that in Alpha. I don't think we've talked about that here in a long time. There's like a God-sized hole inside of us. Only God can fill it, but we feel this emptiness, so we're just going to reach for other things to fill it. This is one of the things we reach for. It's some kind of satisfaction. That really is wrong. It's, it's not treating people with respect, um, but there's a real need for intimacy, and we're just doing it wrong, right? And God has so much mercy for this because God's saying, no, 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 come to me. Come to me. I can fill you with the real, real love and real intimacy. Amen? So sometimes the people that I know that have really overcome this, um, that have such a longing for love, when they fall in love with Jesus, they like fall in love hard <laughs> because they realize this is what they've been looking for. Amen. It's, it's like so powerful. The opposite virtue of lust is chastity, the virtue that moderates that desire. Um, and it's really linked to temperance. It's like in the right amount, at the right time, with the right person, in the right attitude, when you're married, <laughs> all right, all these, all, that's really temperance. Uh, it's just, a, it's a really beautiful thing. Um, and again, it's, it's one of those things that we see it everywhere around us. It's so part of our culture, but when somebody kind of gets um, through that and they get fixed, so to say, that, you know, that it gets cured a bit, they're, they're healed a little bit through that, like this could be the tool or, or, or the reason that they really find what they're looking for, you know, is, 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 is by trying to deal with that particular issue, especially anger. This is another one that I cannot relate to. <laughs> this is really like, this is my biggest recent stuff is anger. To the point of seeking revenge and violence. <laughs> you never want to drive with me. <laughs> and it's not just anger, not just an emotional response, but when you act on it, right? When you act out. When you want harm to another person, not just like, oh my gosh, that makes me angry. I'm going to go pray about this now. <laughs> okay, no, that, that's fine. That can be righteous anger, right? This makes me angry. I'm going to pray about it, and I'm going to have a prudent, temperate response. That's good. But when you say, this makes me angry, I'm going to lash out. Um, I, I like, it lists some things here. I've never done any of these. Swearing, cursing, shouting, ranting and raving, <laughs> brooding over injuries and insults. Do you ever run a conversation through your mind like 6,000 times, thinking of all the nasty things you should have said to that person, right? That's, that's anger. <laughs> Everybody's laughing, so I think I'm not alone. <laughs> Inordinate, violent, hateful anger is always a mortal sin. Wow. I'm in so much trouble. Where would that wound come from, do you think? Right. No matter what she did, she couldn't feel accepted or loved. Not being heard. Yeah, and there's so much. Who are we really resentful towards? Do you think? Yeah, ultimately to God. What it really comes down to is because we're not getting our way. One way or another. We're not getting our way. Well, the brokenness that might come out of that is because maybe we grew up in a, in a situation where it, 
we felt like we never got what we needed. We felt so empty that we think we should get away because we never got our way before. So it's like, I'm going to try to manipulate things so I do get my way. And when it doesn't happen, it just brings up all that stuff, right? What it really comes down to with anger is usually impatience. Mm -hmm. So the antidote is patience. Do not ever ask for that. I was just, just going to say that. Ever. Mindy said, do not ever ask for that in prayer. Because if you ask God, Lord, give me patience, what does he do? <laughs> he gives you every opportunity to be patient. He brings up everything that aggravates you in the world. Right? Be careful what you pray for. But really, with, with anger, um, if we just can recognize, like, why do I think things have to go my way? Again, it comes to pride. The world has to revolve around me. This person is not driving fast enough. Get out of my way because I need to be somewhere. It's just pride again, right? It's just arrogance and pride. So all of that, well, the brokenness, anger is huge. I think that's something that almost everybody at some point has. Gluttony. Oh, my other favorite. <laughs> Too much food or fire water, it says in the... <laughs> Too much food or drink, excessive, immoderate eating and drinking. So it's not eating just to eat. It's eating for extreme pleasure, or it's eating for comfort, or it's eating out of anger and rage, <laughs> or it's eating almost like a lust for food, right? It's not eating for the right reasons. Um, it's, it's really, it's virtually the same thing as lust, but sometimes people don't, they don't turn that desire to, to feed themselves to other people. Sometimes they turn that desire literally to food or to drink, to fill an emptiness that's inside us, right? Lust and gluttony are usually really related. There's a lot of people that, that will struggle with, with both or with one or the other. They overcome one and then they go to the other. Hmm. <laughs> I wonder what's happening here. <laughs> I just, I just revealed so much <laughs> about myself, but we're vulnerable here. Yeah, TMI, TMI. We, we're vulnerable here. We like, we, we don't mind opening up a little bit. So. so it's like a greediness with food, right? So there's something in us that's missing. So we gorge ourselves sometimes. Um, how do we combat that one? How do we combat gluttony? By fasting. And by abstinence from certain foods, maybe, or abstinence from sweets, or whatever it is, that, or drink, whatever it is, that particular thing is. And by, by fasting, we're going to talk about this a lot next week and in, in the weeks ahead as we're coming towards Lent. By fasting from food, you're exercising a spiritual muscle to deny yourself. So what you're really saying is, every time I just want something, I don't just go and get it. I'm denying myself on purpose to build that spiritual muscle of self-denial because then I'm not just thinking about myself all the time, right? I'm going to think about others. Um, moms with new babies, dads with new babies, if, if when the baby's crying, you got to deal with the baby. It doesn't matter what you want right in that moment sometimes, right? And, and I mean, all of us are in different situations like that. But when we're not in that state and we choose to always feed our desires all the time, we're not in a good place, right? Fasting really, fasting helps all of these virtues. It really, really does. It, it, it teaches us how to deny ourselves bit by bit. The last two, greed. Oh, another fun one. The desire for more and more stuff. Usually this is like possessions and shopping and buying and things above people and relationships. Um, same wounds, I think, the same woundedness drives this. You're unfulfilled, so I want to fill that fulfillment somehow. Sometimes we're hiding things. I know a lot of, um, I know some shoppers, maybe, maybe some of you, <laughs> I know some shoppers that this is how they just love shopping and buying things, satisfies them so much because they're really trying, they're really trying to fill some kind of desire. 
and it becomes a greediness. Um, and maybe because we didn't have comfort growing up, maybe we didn't, we were never satisfied growing up. Maybe we That's lived in terrible poverty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we overreact, right? We overreact to it. This is one of the best lines in this whole chapter, I think, page 230, the second paragraph. This is not just for greed, I don't think. This is for all of them. Greed is also a sign of mistrust. And this is huge. I doubt that God will take care of me, so I'm going to take care of myself. Right? That's really where all of these come from. Same thing with lust. God's not going to give me love. I'm going to go take it. Right? Same thing with food. God's not going to fulfill me. I'm going to go take it. Right? It's all the same thing. It, it's really a mistrust of God, which really leads to pride because we think God is not God and we think that we've got more control. Isn't that, that's my favorite line in this whole chapter because that just like sums all of that up. And the way that we combat greed is through generosity. Giving things away is a great way to deal with a sense of greed. Alms giving is one of the, the three big things we do during Lent. We fast. We pray, we give alms. In other words, you give money or you give things. You, you think about other people in a material way. The other two are very spiritual. Um, the best weapon against greed, give your stuff to somebody else, especially something you really love. I mean, it's one thing to give away a can of peas that I'm never going to eat. <laughs> I give away, you know, we go through the cupboard when it's the food drive. I'm not going to eat that. We'll just give that. But no, when it's, when it's like, oh, that's my favorite soup. That's my favorite soup. We have one can. Give that away. And like, that's what we need to do. That's the way that we be. And that not only beats greed, it also <laughs> beats the other issues. <laughs> the overeating. And then the final one, it's not the only. These are not the only sins, by the way. But these are just the seven deadly. Most others flow from this. Sloth or sloth it's sometimes called, or acedia, it's sometimes called in old school Catholicism. I call it sloth, just because that's the way I grew up yeah. hearing it was sloth, but sloth, I think, is what a lot of the teachers say. Um, so what is that? What do you think of when you think of sloth? Laziness. Laziness. I just choose to do nothing. Okay. That does not only mean like I just choose to sleep all day. Sloth can also be, I'm going to sit around and play video games all day, or play cards all day, or whatever it is that's going to keep me occupied so I don't have to do the things I'm supposed to be doing. Sloth can be actually a workaholic. Did you ever know that? Really? A workaholic can be slothful, because what are they really doing? They're being slothful to their spiritual needs or maybe to the needs of their family, the things that they really should be focused on, they're going to stay so busy with distractions that they aren't doing the things they're supposed to be doing. That can be sloth. And a lot of times we don't, we, we kind of don't see that, especially when it comes to prayer. I can't tell you how many people are like, yeah, I'm going to start a prayer time, but I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Like, what are you doing? Well, I'm playing cards. <laughs> you know, I got my phone out. I got, I got to watch this show. I got to do this. Like, you know, plus work and all the other things. Yes. But, but the reality is, man, you're just trying to keep yourself busy so you don't do the things you should be doing. That's sloth. So it's not doing the things that we should be doing. Now, this is not the same if you battle um, like a depression or an anxiety and you cannot, you physically cannot motivate yourself to get up. Um, and it's hard if you're in the middle of that sometimes to distinguish what's going on. Sometimes people that just feel like I can't do anything right, I can't make any decision, everything I do is wrong, the woe is me syndrome, like a lot of times that leads to this. What it's really about is avoidance of the things that we should be doing. That's really what sloth is really about. Um, the best weapon against this, for some reason in the book, I don't know if the publisher just was supposed to put it on the next page and forgot, but they didn't have a, they don't have a paragraph in there about what to do with sloth specifically. But the best weapon against that, we sometimes call it zeal or diligence. 
So in other words, you just get up and go. You just do it. Do what you're supposed to do. Ash Wednesday, which is February 17th, right? February 17th, Ash Wednesday. We do not have class in here that night. There's going to be adoration in the church. We'd like everybody to go to that. Okay, so go to adoration. It starts at 7 p.m. There'll be some music beforehand. So in Ash. And, and there's ash distribution as well. It's not a mass, but there's going to be distribution of ashes and um, adoration. So 7 o'clock in the church for that on February 17th. Now, if you have your little handy-dandy calendar in front of you, you might notice that February 17th, Ash Wednesday, was supposed to be the rite of sending for us as well. We have to change that just a little bit. Um, we found out this afternoon, it's not a big deal, but we have to shift it around a little bit. So our rite of sending is actually going to be at the noon mass on Sunday, February 21st. On the same day as the rite of election. So here's what's going to happen. We'll have noon mass here at the church. We'll get sent officially um, to the bishop. And then we go straight to the bishop <laughs> instead of waiting a few days, right? Which is what was going to happen. So it's kind of a good thing. Well, it is a good thing, but it's kind of neat the way it's going to flow together. And we're still kind of figuring out some logistics and, and timing sort of stuff, but it shouldn't be an issue. Um, New Mass, February 21st for the Rite of Sunday. Okay? Okay. Our glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Goodbye, my friends. Bye. See you next week.